Hello. This video is made as part of a series of videos to support the Advanced High History course, uh, the unit specifically on Northern Britain from the Iron Age through to 1034 AD. This video in particular supports the unit on the factors leading to the creation of Alba, or in other words, how Scotland came to be. This video is the second of two videos that look at the formation of Alba. Video one covered the, the background of the process, starting with the selection of native kingdoms that occupied Northern Britain before Alba was first noted in the historical record in the year 900. Video one covered two of the factors that led to this new kingdom being created. The role of the king, Kenneth McAlpine, and his conquest, and Scottishization, or the amalgamation of two of the major ethnic identities in Northern Britain, the Gaels from the West and Dalyada with the Picts in the East. Video two here will look at the role of the shared Christianity between the Dalyadans in the West and the Picts as a factor leading to the unification, and the role of the common threat, the Norsemen, popularly known as the Vikings. So factor three in how Alba became a kingdom is the role of shared Christianity, a common religion held by both the Gaels in the West and the Picts in the East. Now the kingdom of the Picts and the Scots were united by their Christian faith. The church was primarily a Gallic institution and put pressure on the Scots and the Picts to unite. Unity under a consolidated kingship would lessen violent rivalries and instability in Northern Britain. And in the context of the 9th century AD, that was very much in the interests of the church. In 9th century Northern Britain, we had ostensibly four kingdoms at play. We had Pictland in the northeast of what we would recognise as Scotland today. We had Dalriada in the west, which is commensurate with modern day Argyll. We had the Kingdom of the Britons, the Strathclyde Britons, which was centred on Govan in modern-day Glasgow and controlled lands from the Firth of Clyde as far down as Cumbria. And we had the Kingdom of the Northumbrians, who held the Lothians as far north as the south shore of the Forth, all the way down to what we know as Northern England and Northumberland now. And amongst all that, these four kingdoms are threatened by a new and very foreign invader, the Norsemen, have come across the sea and threaten the stability and the survival of each of these kingdoms. Now the church, in the middle of this mix, favoured political union, bringing all these native kingdoms together, especially if led by the Dalriadans, the people of St Columba. Now this is where the Vikings come into play again as the motivating factor that really just cannot be ignored in terms of the formation of Alba. In the early and the secondary phases of the Viking contact, so if you recall, the Vikings are recorded as first striking in Northern Britain in 793 at Lindisfarne, and then popping up again around the coastline at Iona in 795. That marked the first phase of Viking contact, which was very much about raiding, smash and grab attacks, appearing quickly out of nowhere in their longships, and taking slaves, taking treasure from the monasteries that they raided, and getting out before the, the native kingdoms could rally any kind of significant military opposition to deal with them um, before they were pinned down, really. Uh, within 30 years, 40 years, this had changed to phase two. We're looking very much at kind of longer term invasions and campaigns across uh, northern Britain. So as we're looking at these first two phases of the Viking contact that take us through to the, the middle of the 9th century, um, as the Vikings or the Norsemen, I should say, because Viking really is just such a such a wrong term to use for these guys and ladies. The the Norse that are coming across this, the North Sea from Scandinavia um, have many different names in this period, but Vikings is of a kind of modern appellation, which is quite wrong. Viking is a verb, so to go Viking is to go raiding or to go trading. It's the the act of going off and having yourself a bit of an adventure. It's not a noun. It's not a name for these people, but it seems to have been stuck onto them by uh, later ages. So 
the Norsemen we're going to call them, but I suppose in terms of common usage, Viking is the label they have. Um, so we're talking about the Norsemen here. So as they raided northern Britain's exposed coastal monasteries and then progressed to invasion as they went into phase two of the Viking contact and then occupation of territories we get into phase three, the Gentiles, as the church called them, posed a really serious threat to the church's continuing existence in northern Britain. Now, the Norsemen arrived as pagans and they saw the church, which by the beginning of the raids had been regarded as sacrosanct and above violence by the native kingdoms for two centuries now, they saw it as a freely accessible source of plunder and of slaves. If you can imagine uh, the Norse arriving off the coast at Lindisfarne in 793, they found a monastery that was built next to a coastline. It had no uh, fortification, it had no armed guards nearby, and they didn't need them because in the native kingdoms of Northern Britain at the end of the 8th century, it was known you didn't attack the church. That was, that was the rule that everyone followed. So there was no need for defence. So the Norsemen basically found an open bank which they could land next to, no defenders nearby. Uh, monks really were extremely poor at fighting back. And they could they could raid it as they wished. They could take the wealth, they could take the monks and slaves, they could kill who they wanted with limited opposition, and they could get out before there were any real consequences for the Norsemen. So this means the church are extremely attractive targets for these Norsemen. Uh, and that's going to take its toll over the following decades. So, as I said then, the Norse see the church basically as freely accessible source of plunder and slaves. It's in the interest of the church in Northern Britain to save its own skin by encouraging the native Christianised kingdoms to work together against a common foe. If they can unite those that they control, they have a much better chance of repelling these pagan invaders who are threatening their existence in the north end of Britain. So as early as the 6th century, we've got Irish monks being reported in Pickland introducing the Gallic presence. This is an example of the, the Gallic church really bleeding across into Pickland and bringing that culture with them um, and basically being a form of social glue that was going to bring these two ethnic groups together from a very early starting point. Now, according to Adomnan's Life of Columba, Adomnan himself was an abbot of Iona some kind of 80 years or so after um, Columba, the founder of the, the monastery in Iona, died. Um, he wrote the life of his predecessor, St. Columba, um, almost actually to glorify obviously his predecessor but in a way to, to build up the prestige of Iona as a monastic centre as well. This was this was as well as honouring his predecessor was quite the, the propaganda and prestige statement for the Ionian monks. Anyway, according to Adornan's life of Columba, the saint introduced the Irish Celtic church to northern Pickland. There's evidence of the Columban origin church establishing a strong presence at Port Mahomac uh, in East Cromarty. Now that's just on Tarbert Ness. Now, according to um, Adonan's account, St. Columba crossed the Drumnalbin, which is the kind of mountain range, ridge that uh, separates the Gales in the west and Dalrada from the Picts in the east. And he proceeded up the Great Glen and he met the Pictish king Brady. Um, and to be fair, Adonan is a little bit sketchy on exactly if Columba actually converted King Brady, but the kind of the idea goes that Columba spread the word to the Picts and Christianity took hold then. That also would have obviously built up the prestige of Iona as a Christian centre. So it was in Adonis' interest to spread this story. So the appearance of St Columba and other saints from Gallic Ireland among the Picts from the 590s onward introduced therefore a major cultural influence and it brought the Picts within the Gallic cultural sphere for the next 200 years producing a Christian society that was heavily influenced by Gallic models. So you've got to think as well in terms of a kind of unifying factor, there's this commonality uh, with religion and the church, which is going to be a strong uh, unifying factor, a kind of strong unifying experience for people in Pickland and in Dalriada. What you see in the church in terms of the, the customs is going to be very close, you'd imagine, um, from perhaps that monastery in Port Mahomac to what would be happening in, in Iona itself. You've got to think as well, the churchmen would have given their sermons in Latin, the language of the clergy, the language of the Bible. 
Uh, and this common language meant that the clergy of the Dalriadan Gales and the clergy of the Picts would be able to communicate freely. So we know as well that um, from Adonis' account that St. Columba, when he did cross the drum album to speak to the Pictish king, he needed a translator. That showed there was enough division between the languages of the Picts and the Gales that uh, they wouldn't freely have been able to understand each other. But the church transcends that barrier, doesn't it? Because they have this common language. So uh, originating from the Celtic Church on Iona, the Pictish clerics would likely have shared many practices in their worship with their brethren from the West. And this familiarity could easily be imagined to be the oil to help the two ethnic groups rub along smoothly and over time draw them closer together. Now the church was a very political organisation in Northern Britain at this time. It gained a foothold by offering a powerful elite access to God and the promise of an afterlife. Now the elites of Northern Britain seem to have bought very strongly into Christianity and in exchange for this promised afterlife and glory in the world beyond, uh, the secular powers of Northern Britain seem to have honoured the church with gifts, power and land. Now we can see this, and this has been discussed in previous videos we did on Dalriada where we talked about uh, what the church got out of this relationship. They have access to all types of like pigments that they would have used to illustrate their their manuscripts, like examples of the Book of Kells, um, that stuff doesn't just fall into a lap. That is extremely expensive commodities that are coming their way, and they are gifts of the secular powers. So we see that the, the elites are honouring the church and buying into them. So it gives the church a lot of influence, a lot of power over what's going on um, politically within the kingdoms. So the church, in return, would have bought literacy to the elites amongst the Scots and the Picts. And this allowed the church to embed themselves and their faith into the fabric of Northern British society. To maintain their hold, it was in the church's interest that their converted elite stayed in their power, especially in the face of the pagan Viking threat. But how are they going to do that? Now, the disastrous battle of for true, thinking back to our uh, Kenneth McAlpine factor, uh, in 839 with the the Picts and the Dalriadan combined armies met with the, the Norse and were heavily defeated and the the elites in the aristocracy were decimated. Uh, this disastrous battle for true and the loss of so much of the Pictish elite in 839 coupled with the widespread regression and collapse of the kingdom of Dalriada in the face of continual Norse raids and ongoing settlement as they deprived Dalriada of its lands um, meant that to the church, it must have seemed that their, their position in Northern Britain was teetering on the brink of destruction. Pickland was reeling, Dariada was crumbling away before them. The church must have felt pushed away from the fringes of the, the Northern British mainland and, and pushed really into, in, into the, the core, into the highlands even, into the internal valleys and just hiding. Uh, so they must have felt like they were being hounded out by the pagans. Now, the social bonds that the church had worked to develop with the wider elites had been lost with the wide-scale death of the Pictish and Dalriadan elite, if we're true, and they would have had to work to make new ties and rebuild their position of authority within society, even as the Vikings hovered as the metaphorical wolf at the door. This would have been a very difficult time for the church, and they would have perceived a very real threat um, to their ongoing existence. And their ongoing position of prestige and authority within Northern British society. All this is under threat. But how are they going to react to that? Now, one method for the church to stay in the game, maintain their place of prestige and their authority over the kingdoms of Northern Britain was to promote economic development of those native kingdoms. The more successful the native kingdoms are, the more money, the more land that they can throw the way of the church. Now, this ongoing cycle of gifts giving and the cycle of honouring the church and maintaining their position in society uh, would have been nurtured through the stability provided by a consolidated Christian king. If the church could work it that they brought the kingdoms of Dalriada and Pickland together, it was in their interests to work through one single powerful Christian king that they could give their backing to and that they could support to overcome the Gentile, the pagan threat of the Norsemen.
Now, churchmen were the king's right-hand men, administrators and propagandists, maintaining the mechanisms of government, seeking the stability which unity would bring. Remember all the learning, the education, the power of, of literacy that the church brought to the kings? It built the prestige and it built the authority of the ruling classes. So the two of them, by the time we get to the middle of the, the 9th century, go hand in glove. They go hand in hand in terms of the mechanisms of the state, of keeping the kingdom going. So the church want to maintain this relationship because it's in their um, favour, it's in their benefit to do so. Now, common Christian faith brought shared ideology of kingship based on the former Christian Roman Empire. So imagine, um, we've talked about in our first factor in the unification of Alba, the idea of Kenneth MacAlpine and him building a dynasty. Within Kenneth MacAlpine's dynasty, there are um, two kings quite close to him called Constantine. Now that seems like a random name for a king to pop up within a Pictish and going on afterwards, an Alban royal dynasty. But the reason for that is that by doing so, they are harking back to the ideas of empire, of power, of authority, of prestige, of the, the ruling classes. Um, so the, and that kind of comes through the teachings of the church, the awareness of the church. They're going to build on that. So the royal dynasty are buying into the ideas of this former once used to exist Christian Roman Empire because it is a, almost by that stage, mid 9th century, a legendary idea of a great power unified against an outside barbarian threat. The church are buying into that idea by creating a unified Alba, Christian unified Alba, under a single ruler with very Romanized names um, to fight against the, the pagan barbarian Barian hordes that are threatening their existence. So the church are manufacturing, you can imagine, um, anti-Norse propaganda to really forge something new out of the peoples of Northern Britain, of the indigenous kingdoms, to fight against this external threat. So the common Christian faith meant the church strove to nurture a more peaceful society, ultimately, with no place for petty aggression amongst individual kings, There'd be one Christian king and one church and united they would survive and rise and they would push out this pagan threat. This new system is what the church wanted. An inviolable kingship, orderly, legitimate succession from one ruler to the next and peaceful rule within a peaceful society. Do away with all those internecine wars amongst the Northern British, their various sub kingdoms bring in one overarching kingdom where life will be stable life will be peaceful life will be prosperous and a lot of that profit and a lot of that income is going to come away in the direction of the church so what evidence is there that the church were engineering this unification of alba now we can see this as it permeates the different levels of Northern British society. We can see the hand of the church at play. Now, the church had a role in everyone's life as they pushed forward St Columba as the patron saint of Scotland until he was eventually subordinated by St Andrew later on in this period. Columba shows the power of the Irish church, the Celtic church in Northern Britain. He is the founder of the, the monastery on Iona, to have him honoured as the patron saint of Scotland shows that all the people living in Northern Britain in what will become Scotland are honouring this Celtic church. It shows that the, the church has basically put itself into the heart of the culture of Northern Britain and is receiving respect and will be receiving donations uh, from the wider kingdom. We also see the continued use of Iona as a burial site for Scottish kings and the relic Oran on Iona until the end of the 11th century shows that the, the royalty very much buy into this relationship with the church as well. They value the church and what the church can give them in terms of status, in terms of prestige and perceived authority. If the kings are seen to be supported by the church, then that helps them to solidify their position um, at the head of society. People respect them because they respect the church. So we've got famous kings such as Kenneth MacAlpin. He is buried in Iona, as he believes it is the, the spiritual heartland of Northern Britain. 
And this carries on all for centuries after um, Kenneth. We even have Shakespeare's famous villain, King Macbeth. He is uh, taken there after he's killed in battle in 1057. He also is one of the kings buried there. A wee bit ironically, considering what's going on during this period, we also have um, the Norse-scale leaders of the Lords of the Isles. We have basically Norse elites wanting to be buried on Iona as well later on in this period. Uh, and there are several of them in there too. Mobile Christian clerics become, according to Foster, highly efficient ambassadors for change in political, religious, social and technological spheres. So you see the church is really, really working its own corner here. They are winning the different parts of society over to their cause, which is this united kingdom, which is going to come together, the formation of Alba, to fight against this pagan threat to their existence. Now, further evidence of the unification of the work of the church is that, remember the Picts, the Scots in the West, the Dalriadans, and the elites of both kingdoms and the church altogether shared a common enemy, the Norsemen, or the Vikings, as Hollywood knows them. And you can imagine the mid-9th century, this is, this is a really genuine threat to their ongoing position of power within Northern Britain, and perhaps their ongoing existence as well. It's in the interest of the church that the kingdoms of Dariada and Pickland come together to resist this common foe. And the church is going to engineer the best that they can. Um, a strong Christian king leading a unified army to get the pagans out. And that is going to actually play in to becoming one of the major factors in the formation of the kingdom of Alba and in the genesis of what becomes Scotland. Now, the fourth factor behind the formation of Alba is the unification of the native kingdoms against their common foe, against the Norse invaders. Now, there's a bit of historiography. Mackey argues that the union of the Scots and Pictland was made under Norse pressure, and that inadvertently the Vikings created the need for a consolidated kingdom of Alba, as this proved to be the only real way to resist the, the fearful onslaught of the Norse incursions into Northern Britain. Now, to balance that, other historians such as Alex Wolfe have countered that the Norse could never have expected to take control of the whole of mainland Northern Britain as they lacked the manpower and the resources to fully overcome the native population whilst conflict continued with Anglo-Saxons in the south of Britain and across Ireland. Inland and away from the formidable fleets of longships, time proved that native armies could contain and defeat the Norse. Now, it's important to remember that the Norse are very much uh, a force or a power that is based across the North Sea. So when they come across and they uh, undertake their summer campaigns uh, into Northern Britain, the further away they get from the longships, the more skittish they're going to be. Those longships are their means of getting back home at the end of that campaign. And without those ships, they risk basically being trapped in a foreign land, surrounded and killed. So they're going to be quite skittish to leave the coastline um, for any length of time and to leave those ships exposed. And they're going to be quite reticent to get involved in any pitched battle with a native army. The more men, warriors, that the, the Norse army loses, the less effective they become as a fighting force. And the more difficult it is to recoup their losses. They'd have to sail back home in the autumn and return um, in the summer with a, a fresh force but you've got to bear in mind as well that in terms of the, the kind of like feeling amongst their, their people back home if they come home off the back of an unsuccessful invasion then that's going to be a demotivating factor for warriors to want to participate in next summer's campaign because they're going to see oh look what happened to them the year before you guys got pasted I don't know if I want to do that so it's about building on successes and further successes for the Norse whereas the natives have that ace in their hand that if they can pin the Norse down to a situation where it looks like it may go against the Norse, the Norse are likely to pull back. Um, and that's one of the few things that plays into the, the hands of the native kingdoms as this goes on. And although individually weak, 
as we've seen with what happens with the Kingdom of Dalriad in the West, they they bore the, the first brunt of the, the Viking contact and really did just very quickly cave in as a viable kingdom. Um, although individually weak then, if the many band together with a common cause, they can overcome the most powerful of, any, of enemies. If we can get the native kingdoms to bind their military strength together, bind their manpower and their um, resources together, then they are far more likely to come up with a force that can repel, resist and force out the, the pagan invaders. So we're going to now look at the pressure on the Scots and then move on to look at the Norse pressure on the Picts and how it affected these two different populations. So the pressure on the Scots and the seaborne threat posed by the Vikings necessitated a shift of power to the east. The Dalriadans did not have the, the naval capability, even though they were basically a sea power. So much of their trade income was based on trade coming up from the, the west coast of Francia, from the Mediterranean even, and um, trading off with Dalriadan ports. And they would have had, obviously, their own ships, their own um, seaborne forces to patrol their lands, maintain the, their, their own power. But these forces are not a match for this new technology of the Viking longship the Norse longship that's coming across the, the seas from the east. Um, likewise, their, um, their retinues of warriors are not really on a par with what are almost semi-professional warriors coming across heavily armed um, and appearing out of the blue. So Dalriad is taken by surprise and completely blindsided by the arrival of the Norse and they're unable to react. They are unable to gather uh, naval forces in sufficient strength to repel lightning attacks by the Norse who can just appear out of nowhere, do their damage and be gone within a few hours. So that means necessarily that the, the Dalriadans lose control of the islands very quickly and then they are forced away from the coast as these become very dangerous and liminal areas, frontier zones with these new um, Norse who very quickly actually settle isles and take them over. Um, so the Dalriadans are forced inland, which is the, the opposite of what their kingdom was really about. So this is a really an existential threat to what it is to be uh, Dalriadan. Now Clarkson in 2013 contended that there were regular attacks by the Vikings on the west coast and these were putting pressure on the Scots. This is the case. The, the kingdom of the Scots is on its knees very, very quickly and they're forced to give up their islands. They, they lose the power over the seas and they are forced inland away from the, the shores of their, their um, lochs and glens. The Vikings concentrate their efforts on the west coast and the isles as they are exposed to the seaborne attacks favoured by the Norse and the terrain is very familiar to them. Um, the sea locks of Argyll are very close to the, the sea fjords of uh, western Norway. So this terrain would very much mirror the homelands um, on a, for the Norse of what they knew on the west coast of Scandinavia. The very nature of the landscape made it impossible for the native kingdoms to adequately defend against the strength of seaborne threat as posed by the Norse. Now, Driscoll uh, suggested that the Viking predations caused nothing less than the remaking of the political landscape. This is the case within 50 years of the, the initial Viking contact in Iona in 795, Dalriada is really about to cease to exist as a, a functioning kingdom. Now, excluded from his territory in the west, Kenneth MacAlpin, as king of Dalriada, had to remake the institutions of power and cultural identity and make them fit for the, the Scots, who fled as refugees and migrated east into the, the southern part of Pictland um, in mainland northern Britain. So we see here the pictures on, on the, the screen. We've got elements here of how McAlpin went about that. And this is as a result of the pressure placed on the Kingdom of Dalriada by the Norse. They had to remake their cultural heart, really, in a new place. So we have um, Schoon is identified as a royal centre by McAlpin, and it's where he puts the Stone of Destiny. So he takes what he can from... Danad in the royal centre of the kingdom of um, Dalriada. He obviously can't take the footprint stone with him because it's stuck in the top of the hill. Um, but he could take the stone of destiny with him. And that becomes part of the that royal inauguration ceremony within their new lands off to the east. Um, he also 
builds himself a royal palace at Fortiviat, and he mixes in ideas of the Celtic Gallic Christianity. Um, but we also see that the this is starting to fuse with Pictish customs there. So there are square barrows that the Picts used to bury their elites in um, at that site. So it could be argued that Kenneth McAlpin took the initiative to move east from Dariada in the face of Viking pressure uh, and then subsequently moved on to take over the Pictish kingdom. But you could argue it is the Norse that made him do that. So the argument is there that the Norse basically created the impetus for McAlpin to um, act as he did. But for the more realistic view is that the Vikings displaced the Gaels and their political structures impelling them to move east. It wasn't just McAlpin that did this. This was an ongoing process and it had been happening for decades before he comes along. But still, at the heart of it is the arrival of the Norse that force that Gallic population to move east across mainland northern Britain. So in the face of Norse pressure, the Dalriadic nobility would have been increasingly attracted to the wealth and what they perceived of as the security offered by resettling in Pickland. And remember as well, in terms of land mass and agricultural potential, Pickland offers far more than anything the Dariadan nobles could have uh, harvested from the, the small agricultural lands of the, their sea lochs, the headlands and the steep glens of Dariada. The Norse seemingly unstoppable in their ancestral lands lost as the 9th century progressed, the Dariadan nobility had less and less to lose by risking a fresh start over in the east. And the part of Dariada taken over by the Vikings did not become part of the Kingdom of Alba, um, this new united kingdom of Gael and Pict. It instead became known as the lands of the Gaul-Gael, and eventually they would become part of what high medieval history would call the Lordship of the Isles. Now, divorced from their native homelands, in a sense, it was the kingship of the Scots that disappears and not that of the Picts. As Macalpe moves east, he poaches the, the throne of Pictland. He is not taking the throne of Dariada with him. He, that's, la, that's lost. That's gone behind him. He is a, a mixed heritage Pict and Gael who is taking the throne of Pictland. Now in his wake behind him, the Gaul Gael, the land of the foreign Gaels, that's the Western Isles. Now they're completely lost to the Norse settlers and the colonisation doesn't stop with the Isles. Placing them evidence shows that the western coast of the mainland were also colonised. Although within only one or two generations, the Norse settlers had mixed with the native population to produce this new group, the Gaul Gael, the foreign Gaels. One of the strongholds was the former seat of Ken O'Kell, it's one of the septs of the Kingdom of Dalriada. Uh, they took the fort of Donegal on the southern tip of Butte, that becomes a seat of uh, one of the Gaul Gael kings. So we know that from Norse history, it seems to be that uh, the closest land masses to Scandinavia, the Shetlands and the Orkneys, seems to be where families of colonists and families of settlers come to stay in the third phase of the, the Norse contact with Northern Britain, the, the period of colonisation and settlement. It seems to be, is more the case, that um, single, young adventurers are making the trip further on and they're the ones that are coming in long ships down the western coast of northern Britain and these young men, more than likely predominantly young men, are going to look to eventually settle down and take a mate and they take the native women. The men are killed or enslaved, the women are kept and are taken for families and that's how this cultural fusion is happening out there in the Western Isles. The Gaul Gale come from Norse men taking Gale women and uh, the subsequent generations would have been, you expect, bilingual, and some of that culture would have been held onto by the women and survived through into the next generations. And we can see in the Western Isles, the culture is very much Norse and strongly Norse uh, for a long time. But as I said just a wee bit earlier on there, within a generation or two, those settlements along the coast of the, the west coast of the mainland, they revert back to, to Gaelic place names. So that shows that the the native culture is far stronger amongst the settlement there. So it's almost like the native culture is slightly resisting uh, the oncoming wave 
of the Norse. And over time, they assimilate the Norse. And um, the two cultures very much mixed together. But for that, they are not part of Alba. They are very much something different, something separate. They are an enemy, which feeds into this factor as a motivating reason for the formation of the Kingdom of Alba. We have a, an enemy right on our doorstep which is forcing the native surviving kingdoms to band together against this very powerful common threat. So now let's look at the Norse pressure on the Picts. How does it affect the, the kingdom of the Picts to the east of Nordenbrunn? Now the Viking incursion was important for imbalancing Pictland politically. It gradually weakened the Picts, and it lost in the northern and the western isles. We see that they lose Orkney, um, which was held before the Norse arrived by the Kingdom of Fertru. And the Norse made their way down into mainland northern Britain and took Caithness. They may have made it down as far as modern Inverness. So we can see that the they gradually lose land as the Norse progress their way down in northern Britain, as you can see marked in red on the map. Uh, the significant Viking victory over the Picts at the Battle of Fertru in 839, just before uh, Kenneth took over the throne, also decimates the, the Pictish elite, which is going to be a significant problem for um, the ongoing stability of the kingdom. And that's recorded as a, one of our primary sources by the Annals of Ulster in the year 839, and they say, as recorded by the Irish monks, a battle was fought by the Gentiles, remember the church called the Norsemen the Gentiles, um, against the men of Fertru, and a large number fell in the engagement. So we see that the Picts have lost the, a great share of their elite. They've also lost a lot of their fighting manpower. So the Norse impact on Pictland is seeing them gradually being worn down, gradually losing lands, and then we have this catastrophic uh, event in 839 which really pushes them to the edge. Now, the Norse in the Battle of Fertru in 839 may have killed a great deal of the Pictish nobility and that would have created a Pictish power vacuum for Kenneth MacAlpin and the Scots nobility from Dalriada to exploit. So it was easier for the Scots to exploit Pictish weakness and take control in Pictland rather than to stick around in Dalriada and fight against the Vikings taking their lands in the west. The migration, the opportunity caused by the Viking assault led to a coming together of Picts and Gales as they shared the land and worked together against a common foe. Kenneth McAlpin was peripheral in the Gaelicization of the Picts. Now, as we looked at in part one of our video on the formation of Alba, we looked at the role of Kenneth McAlpin and we looked at the Scottishization or the Gaelicization of the Picts. Basically, the two uh, native cultures and ethnic identities really kind of coming together um, to form the Kingdom of Alba. The argument is here that Kenneth McAlpin was not the man that magically made that happen, that the Gaelicization of the Picts was an ongoing process that had been happening for centuries. And you're arguing here, really, that the Norse, just like McAlpin, kicked this process on. They made this happen a lot faster. They accelerated it because there was a need. There's a real need for these two ethnic groups to come together because the, the devil's at the door. The Vikings are there and they are looming as a deadly threat to the ongoing survival of the native kingdoms. Now we've looked at the pressure the Norse applied to the Scots, the Dalriadans in the west, and we looked at the pressure they applied to the Picts, but it's important to remember there are two other kingdoms in northern Britain um, who were extant at the time the Norse first showed up. We've got the Britons of Alclut, who are based around what we know as modern day Dumbarton, and the Anglo-Saxons of Northumbria, who controlled from the Firth of Forth all the way down into modern Northumberland. So these Viking attacks uh, weren't limited to the, the Dalriadans and the Picts. They had a go at these other kingdoms too. Now, Vikings attacks weakened the Britons of Strathclyde from 870, when the Vikings in Dublin sailed with a massive fleet up the Firth of Clyde, and they besieged and sacked the royal fortress of Alclut, or Dumbarton Rock. This led to the destruction of the Kingdom of Alclut, because that's where its royal centre was, and the beginning of a successor kingdom, um, 10 miles inland and up the river, presumably further away from the Vikings, um, 
the successor kingdom of Strathclyde was created uh, and they moved their royal centre to Govan. Now, in the 870s, the Vikings had besieged Alclut for an unheard of term of four months. And as I said a little bit earlier on, the Vikings don't want to be pinned down by a native army. It is in their interest to stay mobile, stay in the move, take plunder, take slaves, and get out before they can lose that manpower and lose their strength. So to stick around and actually lay siege to a stronghold is rare during this period. But nevertheless, the Norse did that in 870 when they hit Alclut. And the Viking fleet was led by two Viking kings of Dublin, which was a major Viking stronghold um, uh, during this period. Those kings were Ivar and Olaf. Some scholars consider Ivar to be identical to Ivar the Boneless, although we can't pin that down, um, a Viking commander from the great heathen army, named in contemporary English sources who also appears in Icelandic sagas as the youngest son of the legendary Viking Ragnar Lothbrok. Um, if you watch your TV series Vikings, you'll know all about him. Now, they clearly lacked the necessary siege equipment to force their way into Alclut, regardless of how huge their army was. The defenders only surrendered once their well dried up and they ran out of water after four months of siege. Thousands, we're told, were taken as slaves. And I don't quite think that there were thousands hidden inside the, the stronghold of Alclut. Once Alclut, the stronghold, fell, it probably gave the, the Norse attackers free reign to, to raid the surrounding heartlands of the kingdom and take plunder and take slaves from the people they found. Uh, so those thousands were taken as slaves and shipped to the slave markets in Dublin, along with uh, a royal captive. They took the king of Alclut when his fortress fell, a man named Artgal. In 872, Artgal would be killed possibly on the advice of King Constantine of Alba, son of Kenneth MacAlpine. And Artgal would be succeeded by his son Rune Ab Artgal, who became the king of Strathclyde after his father's death. Now it seems there's some political shenanigans on the go there, because it's likely that Rune ruled as a subordinate of Constantine, who was his brother-in-law, providing a possible motive for the death of Artgal. It's rumoured that Constantine had ordered Artgal to be killed, so that Rune, who was in Constantine's pocket, would succeed as king and that would give this brand new shiny king of Alba control over his neighbouring kingdom of um, Strathclyde. Now, Strathclyde remained as a player even though he had experienced this terrible calamity at the hands of the, the Norse in 870. Um, it remained on the scene for more than a century afterwards as a real player in northern British politics but by 1000 AD the kingdom of Strathclyde was in terminal decline they were the last outpost of the Northern Britons, and to be fair, it's pretty remarkable that they held out for so long against powerful and often warlike neighbours. So if you can see that the, the Norse precipitated really the kind of long decline of the, the Northern Britons, the Viking raids also weakened the Angles of Northumbria, terminally so, um, allowing the Scottish leadership of Alba to expand. Driscoll suggests that MacAlpine's annexation of Pictland was more a result of Viking pressure than it was as a result of successful conquest of the Picts. Albert emerged out of the maelstrom of Viking turbulence that is affecting wider northern Britain during the 9th century. Now, before we move on and look at our conclusions over what really was the main motivating factor in the formation of Alba, let's not forget the contribution of the Picts to creating this new kingdom of Alba. It's not all about the Gaels coming in from the west and basically hijacking everything and taking it over. The Picts themselves and what Pictland was played a major role in making the successor kingdom of Alba. Now, the kingdom of the Picts is far larger than Dalriada and Argyll. It was more populous. It was agriculturally richer, they had far better farmland, uh, which is of course part of the attraction for the Scots and the Vikings to come and have a go. According to Foster, undoubtedly the agricultural wealth of Pictland was an enormous temptation to power-hungry warlords to come and try and take a bite of it. It's important to remember as well, it is in fact the Dalriadan kingship which disappears, not the Pictish one. Kenneth MacAlpine, when he takes over, takes over the Pictish throne. He doesn't bring his own um, system of power and monarchy from Dalriada with him. The Pictish kingdom is also highly organised. It's not as perhaps murky and primitive as early historians may have made out. 
The Pictish Kingdom is in fact highly organised it boasts an army, a navy, an obligation to military service amongst men of fighting age. It has its own taxation system. It had judges, powerful royal officers, more mayors who are sub-kings, thanes who represented um, kin groups, and it was all supported by the church. Now, these are features of a sophisticated and a well-organised society. Kenneth McAlpin would not have been so successful in establishing his new kingdom had he not been able to build upon people's familiarity with pre-existing power structures and organisation. The wealth and power of the new Alba is no doubt predominantly Pictish. Now, the primacy of St Andrews, the head church of Pictland, was not eclipsed despite the growing importance of Dunkeld, which McAlpine set up as a, uh, a centre of Christianity when he took power um, and installed the relics of St Columba there. So it shows the continuation of what's important to Pictland as um, a locus for, for power and for prestige within the successor kingdom of Alba. Schoon was already an important Pictish centre before Kenneth McAlpine made it his royal centre, perhaps bringing to it the Stone of Destiny with him. And it's important to remember that several men before Kenneth McAlpine were kings of both kingdoms of Dalriada and Pictland simultaneously, and some of them were from the Pictish royal house. For example, we've got Angus, son of Fergus, who was king of Picts from 729 to 761. He also ruled the Scots from 741 to 750, and Constantine I, who ruled both kingdoms for a while at the end of the 8th century. The successful formation of Alba as a new kingdom relied heavily upon utilising the pre-existing resources of Pictland. So, to consider our conclusions in the formation of Alba, what really was behind the emergence of this new kingdom. So let's look first at what happens in the, the immediate aftermath of our four factors we've looked at today. The Scots slowly expanded their authority southwards. In the 11th century, the kingdom of Strathclyde was taken over to become a sub-kingdom of the Scots. Lothian was also taken over as the Viking threat receded and the English kings eventually recognised Alba's authority in this area. Victory at the Battle of Carham in 1018 became a recognisable date from which the Scots' authority was extended south down to the Tweed. Now, the Battle of Carham between the army of the Earl of Northumbria, Uhtred the Bold, and the Allied army of the Strathclyde Britons and Alba uh, may have seen King Owain of Strathclyde slain. His kingdom disappeared from the historical record soon after, Northumbria was defeated at the battle and they relinquished territory north of the Tweed um, as far as the fourth to Alba and its king Malcolm II. So we can see that the victory at Carr really is a kind of milestone in the history of Northern Britain and that we see the border, as it were, with the Anglo-Saxon uh, what will become English powers to the south. Uh, we see the that kind of frontier solidify around the River Tweed, which will become close to the uh, the modern border between England and Scotland. And we also see the Strathclyde Britons lose their autonomy and merge with the, the wider Kingdom of Alba. In the west, the Vikings and the Galgale continue, however, to hold the western and the northern isles, as we can see on our map here, along with Caithness and much of Galloway well into the 13th century. Alba's seat of power is certainly in the east of the mainland and centred for a long time around Strathairn, near modern day Perth. The capital of Alba, or what will become Scotland, doesn't move south to Edinburgh for some time yet. By the year 1000 AD, a Scotland that is recognisable in terms of modern boundaries has, however, been born. You see, marked um, on the map, Alba makes up most of what will become modern day Scotland, Strathclude will be added to that, although we will not get their lands in um, Cumbria, as they are now, and the majority of Northumbria um, is subsumed into Alba too. The Western Isles will not come over to uh, mainland uh, Scotland, as it were, until King Alexander III, um, who defeated the Vikings at the Battle of Largs in 1263, um, ratified a treaty with them in 
1286, uh, which promised Scottish control to the Western Isles. Well, the Orkneys would remain in Norwegian possession until the 15th century. So in summary, we can see there was no flashy, immediate political revolution. No unification was caused by one single man. Rather, there's an evolutionary process that lasted hundreds of years, which involved the Picts as much as it did the Scots. So there are four factors of the role of Kenneth MacAlpine, of the Scottisization or the Gallicization of the Picts, of the unifying force of the, the common Christian church, and of the, the force of the common enemy, of the Norsemen arriving. Perhaps of those four, the one that we would identify as being the most significant is that steady process of the Gallicization of the Picts as the native populations steadily fused and merged over the centuries through the early medieval period. So to finish off the video, as promised in part one, I've shared here a slide of the historiography we mentioned throughout the two videos. Students of this era might be interested in this, so I thought it would be a good idea to share it here. So that's it for our two videos on the formation of Alba and how modern day Scotland was born. I hope you enjoyed, and uh, that's it for now. Thanks for watching.